River Thames. The very name is older than history. Probably the oldest British name we know that is still in use. For Caesar himself reported that it was called Tamasis. 2,000 years have vindicated the Romans' choice of London as the nerve center of Britain and the Thames as its vital artery. Not a very long river, a mere 209 miles. Not a very wide river. But no highway in the world is so packed with history, so rich in variety, so bustling with life every yard of the way. And from one end to the other, no river on earth has so many different things happening on it as the River Thames. These men, for instance, they have a strange job and a strange name. They're called Swan Uppers. Once a year, they row the 65 miles from Henley to the old Swan Pier by London Bridge, reach by reach and lock by lock, taking a census of all the swans on the river. Every Thames swan belongs either to the Queen or to one of two London guilds, the Dyers or the Vintners. It's all decided by family tree. The swan uppers round up each new family of swans and mark the signet beaks in the same way as their parents. The Dyers and the Vintners have their own marks and the royal birds are left unmarked. So by looking at any Thames swan's beak, you can tell who has owned his ancestors for centuries back. This has been going on for generations, and so has this. They are Thames sailing barges, lining up for their annual race. Once the lower reaches of the river were full of these beautiful craft, the age of power is thinning their numbers. But there are still enough left, and doing a sturdy job of work, to remind us that the Port of London's greatness was founded on sail. Another annual Thames race, the springtime contest between Oxford and Cambridge universities from Putney to Mortlake. Like so much of what happens on the river, it's a free spectacle, and so popular and established that all England calls it simply the boat race. London's river, the Royal River. Here, through the centuries, the bustle of traffic has paused to watch the sovereign go by. London salutes Queen Elizabeth II, sailing up the tideway in her trim, modern Britannia, just as four centuries ago it saluted Queen Elizabeth I in her gilded barge. And now, as then, a royal visit is an occasion for pageantry, for another free show. Some events on the Thames happen every year, others, like this, when occasion demands. But all the time, something is going on. Yes, the Thames is a river where anything can happen. Like a beautiful woman, London is particularly pleased with herself when daylight fades and the lights go up. Piccadilly, of course, is her gayest and gaudiest jewel, as dear to the Londoner as it is to the tourist. The wide-eyed sightseer beside you may be from Tooting or Texas, Dartford or Delhi. 
But whoever he is, he won't know the full charm of London by night until he's been on the river. All for free. But it's worth spending a few shillings on a boat trip along the Thames through the heart of London, for now it's at its best. Banks and bridges strung with pearls, black velvet water alive with shifting diamonds, Aladdin's cave spilling onto the darkened river. Some of it is designed for effect, some of it just happens. But the very richness of its variety gives it a harmony of its own. This is Chelsea Bridge, the first of the river's many graceful suspension bridges that you pass under as you sail upstream from London. But it's London itself we want to see, so we'll merely take a look towards Festival Gardens, the light-hearted playground in Battersea Park, before turning our bows downstream towards the city. Just below Chelsea Bridge is the Tate Gallery, Britain's finest collection of modern art. Much of its contents was, in fact, painted within a mile or two of its walls. For artists have always loved this part of London. A few minutes later, we are sailing past the Houses of Parliament and standing sentinel over them, the most famous clock in the world, Big Ben. The Parliament of Britain is at one end of Westminster Bridge and the Parliament of London at the other. County Hall, headquarters of London County Council. And not far below that, a post-war newcomer, the Royal Festival Hall by the southern end of Waterloo and Hungerford Bridges. Big Ben isn't London's biggest clock. This is the clock on Shelmeck's house. Waterloo Bridge is London's newest, built in the 30s to replace one which had begun to sink in the middle. In the floodlit building are millions of names. It's Somerset House, headquarters of Britain's Registrar General. This is Unilever House by Blackfriars Bridge. And now, ahead, we can see the city's crowning glory by night or day, St. Paul's Cathedral. Wartime damage performed one service for London, at least the great cathedral, which over the years had almost disappeared among a jungle of buildings, can now be seen as its architect Sir Christopher Wren intended. Warships and windjammers, cable ships and colliers, tugs and tankers, luggers and liners. In the Pool of London, you'll see every kind of vessel that sails the oceans of the world. Ever since, nine centuries ago, William the Conqueror built his tower as the sentinel of port and city, the commerce of the civilized world has sailed under its walls. Most of the great ships that sailed these reaches in years gone by are no longer even names. But one is both a name and a presence. Cutty Sark, perhaps the best known of all the proud tea clippers. Now in her last berth at Greenwich, she is a museum, a landmark, and an evening school for amateur navigators. Her canvas is stowed, her anchor is weighed for good. But she still plays her part in teaching men the ways of the sea. At Greenwich, the ageless Thames forgets the city and starts to dream of the ocean. And here, too, it says goodbye to the splendor of state. For the Palace of Greenwich is the last of the great royal palaces on our downstream journey. Some say it is the finest building on the riverfront. Plantagenet, Tudor, Stuart, Hanoverian monarchs had a hand in its making. And our two greatest architects, Wren and Inigo Jones, gave it its present shape. Now it houses the Royal Naval College and the National Maritime Museum. Suitable occupants, for here on the Zero Meridian, the Thames becomes part river, part sea. London is behind us, and London's river is outward bound.